Hello and welcome to another episode of A Simple Path to Wellbeing podcast. My name is Paul Garrigan. So in this episode, we're going to be talking about intimacy. And this goes back to, to the previous podcast, where I began describing the different aspects of well-being, which include wonder, intimacy and trust. So today we're going to be focusing on this intimacy. The Zen master Dogen referred to awakening as intimacy with the 10,000 things. With the 10,000 things meaning everything. So he described awakening as being intimate with everything. And the same applies to well-being. That the, the well-being I'm talking about means becoming intimate with everything. Becoming intimate with ourselves, with other people and the world. When I was younger, I would have um, associated this word intimacy with, with, with sex. But of course, that's not what intimacy means. In fact, it's perfectly possible to have sex without any intimacy. So it's important here that we distinguish between the two of those. So when I talk about intimacy, what I actually mean is connection. It's this sense of connection. And it's a, ma- it's, a, it's, a, it's a major driving force in our lives. So this yearning for intimacy, this yearning for connection can get us into all kinds of trouble if we go about it the wrong way. This week I, I led a workshop on compassion and emptiness. And in the workshop I was talking about how how there's this, this kind of obstacle to compassion. And this same ob- obstacle also applies to intimacy. In fact, we can think of compassion as intimacy with suffering, whether it's our own suffering or other people's suffering. So intimacy is very, very much a part of compassion. But there's some obstacle that prevents us from experiencing this. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. I remember as a, as a, as a young child, I was maybe, maybe seven or eight years old. I can't remember exactly when. And I was with some friends and we were in a forest. And I got into an argument with one of the other kids. And the rest of the group came along and, and what they did to, to kind of sort out our, our argument was to get us to make a tree house together. So me and this other fella. So we made this tree house together and we were made to sit in, in it and we, and we were actually told to, to hold hands. And at the time all this seemed perfectly reasonable to me. But I remember sitting there and just feeling this incredible sense of connection with this other kid. This incredible sense of openness and vulnerability with this other kid. Deep sense of connection. And it was so wonderful because I hadn't had much of that in my life or I couldn't remember much of that in my life. And it was this incredible moment. But then some older kids came along and started making fun of us. And so automatically I became very self-conscious. And that sense of connection disappeared. And this reminds me of the story of, of you know, the, you know that, that story from the Bible about the Garden of Eden and how Adam and Eve, you know, eat from the, the, the what's it, the tree of wisdom. That's the apple from the tree of wisdom or, or, or whatever it is. And as soon as they do that, they become very self-conscious and they realise they're naked. But their nakedness wasn't a problem up until that point. It is becoming self-conscious that becomes this obstacle to intimacy. One of the wonderful things about stillness is that when we experience stillness, that sense of disconnection just disappears. So the, the most effective thing we can do to experience intimacy, to experience a sense of connection with ourselves is to just be still. 
Because when we do that, all the resistance disappears. And we're not able to reject ourselves in any way. That's what stillness does. And the same applies to other people. One of the, the wonderful gifts we can give other people is to just be still with them. And in fact, this is a sign of true, true friendship to be able to sit, sit in, sil- in stillness with somebody without having to say anything, without feeling uncomfortable. And there's something incredibly nurturing and warm about sitting in stillness. When my years nursing, I, I, I was often with people as they were dying. And what I saw was that words weren't so important, at least not words coming from me during those, th- th- those times. But one of the most wonderful things you could do for a person is just sit with them. And if they wanted to, to, to hold their hand or something. That's what gave the sense of connection. That's what gave the, the sense of compassion. But instead of stillness, we often have this barrier, our barriers up. And that's what creates, that's the, the obstacle to intimacy and it's also the obstacle to, to compassion. That we put our, our guard up, our barriers up. We need, like, and it comes from this sense, this need to defend ourselves. So growing up, you know, we felt vulnerable. And we respond to this by creating a barrier between us and the world and that's the job of the ego. But unfortunately that barrier, while it may in the beginning protect us, it soon becomes a prison. And it means that suddenly we are alone against the world. But that barrier, that sense of separation only exists in the mind. I've had some many strange things happen in in, in meditation. And and sometimes there can be these images that, that come up, very strong images. Or strong experiences that include an image. And I remember one years ago where... I suddenly have to, had this image of being a, a Benedictine monk in France in the 19th century. And it seemed like a, a past life experience. I didn't, I didn't trouble myself trying to figure out if it was real or not, but it, was very, it felt very real. And it certainly had a very profound impact on my life. Because I, I got a lot of information along with the image and it was this sense that this monk was really struggling at this point in his life. And what it was, he was in this community, this this Benedictine community of Christian monks. And he, despite all his years and his piety, and he did all the correct things, you know, in in regards to the rules and, and, and you know, performing, performing his duties, and actually he went beyond what was necessary. He still felt completely lost. And the thing that was making him feel feel this way was that he was completely disconnected from the rest of the community. Because deep down he, he despised them all. And he, he's this, he despised them all. And these people he'd been living with for decades. But he despised them. And he despised them because they didn't behave like the way he felt they should behave. He felt they weren't as pious as him, or they were, they weren't as as holy as he would want them to be. And this, over the years, this has kind of had chipped away at his peace of mind, and he felt in this incredible turmoil about having to be with these people all the time, these people that he didn't like. And I had the sense that you know this guy was near the end of his life. So it was a very, very powerful image. So after I had the image, I didn't, as I say, I didn't waste much time figuring out whether it was real or not. But I could definitely see it had a real significance for my own life because a very similar dynamic was playing out in my own life and that I found it really hard to connect with other people because they usually fail to live up to my expectations, my ideas for them. And that had caused so much trouble in my life. But looking at this image of another person, I could very, I could see things more objectively, and I could see things far more clearly. And I saw for that monk 
the, the problem was him. That the problem was that he had these expectations for other people. And because those expectations weren't being met, he, he couldn't allow himself to feel connected to them. But of course, none of that had to be that way. None of that had to be true. He didn't have to have those expectations. And if he could just accept those people as they are, without all his conditions, then that sense of connection could be there and he wouldn't be in turmoil. And as soon as I kind of realised that for him, I I realised, well, obviously the exact same applies to me as well. That if 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 I'm waiting for everyone to be the way I think they should be, or I'm waiting for the world to behave in the way I feel it should, or I'm waiting for myself to live up to some expectations that, that who knows where they've come from, it will never be possible for me to feel a sense of connection. But all I have to do is, is see those, those ideas for what they are. There's nothing true about them. They're just stories that we tell ourselves about how things should be. And those stories are there, you know, to help us navigate life. But when we mistake them and actually believe that that's how the world should be, that puts us in conflict with the world. That creates the, creates a sense of disconnection. Because, of course, it's not possible for us to be disconnected from the world. Because we are the world. Every part of our experience belongs to the world. This body comes from the earth. The thoughts come from the society. None of it is separate. So we we develop this sense of a of a self that's separate from experience, but that's just a a a helpful illusion to help us navigate life. But really, there is no self separate from experience. This was the, the powerful thing that the Buddha discovered. It's this insight into no self. There is no self separate from experience, or at least there's no self to be found that's separate from experience. So if you take away all your experiences, what do you have? And that's a very good thing to investigate. So basically, we're telling ourselves these stories about who we are, about how the world should be, about how we should be. But when we are able to drop those stories and become still, there automatically is this sense of intimacy. One of the interesting things about it is we all live in our own little universe. We're not There's no little man in our heads looking out with binoculars. That, in a very real sense, this this world that we're experiencing is is, is created in our mind just like a dream. Sure, we notice it. We believe it's based on something. We, you know, we believe that there's something out there. We don't know there's something out there, but we certainly believe there's something out there. And there's good reasons. There's good arguments for why there, why why there, that, that there could be something out there. But there's no, there's no kind of final conclusive evidence that there's something out there. But even if there is something out there, that's not what we experience. We experience our brain's interpretation of what, what's out there. And that interpretation is unique to each one of us. So what could be more intimate? What could we be more connected to than an experience that only we are having? That is our own creation, if you will. If you just take a moment and just look around without the judgments without the expectations and just be still 
and notice how connected you are to everything. So it's good to practice experiencing the sense of intimacy. But ultimately, with well-being, it, it's not a practice. It's something that develops over time. That as we spend more and more time being still, and we become more and more aware of how we become deceived, this intimacy just naturally becomes part of our experience. And the idea of, of this separateness, of disconnection, just becomes ludicrous. So in the next episode, we'll be looking at trust, which is the other third aspect of well-being. So if you enjoy this podcast, please, please consider sharing with other people. Please subscribe or leave a review or do all of those things. If you'd like to do some coaching with me, please contact me. I'll leave details in the description. So until next time.